community is blessing that. And there will be many more to come. So we're excited about that, too. Um, please spread the word. Please let your neighbors, your family know that we're going to have Sunday school, and it's going to be a lot of fun. And also, prayerfully consider if the Lord is seeking you for an opportunity to help us in this ministry. Um, we are going to be having an, um, a meeting on the 29th, a week from tomorrow at 6 p.m. for all those who are interested in helping in this. We're looking, you know, of course, opportunities to teach, be assistants in the classroom, and provide snacks. So we're just looking for um, those who are interested in serving in this ministry. Um, and again, I want to mention, if you will, please, sign up for the rally Sunday so that we can plan for the amount of food we're going to need. And if you have any questions, please contact me or Phyllis Samella. Phyllis is our Sunday school superintendent. She is on fire for this ministry. I'm so excited. And we are looking forward to this uh, grand opening of our Sunday school program here at Good Shepherd. Thank you. Bible verse that uh, that I centered my ministry around uh, when I when I was ordained, Second uh, Samuel chapter eighteen verse twenty three. I could tell you the whole story of Second Samuel eighteen, as you well know. <laughs> We'd be here all morning, um, but the, uh, the 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 Bible verse in Hebrew, Vihi ma arutza, and in English, come what may, I must. And the whole point of that uh, story is that the person who says that uh, has witnessed the good news. In Hebrew, basar. The basar is the good news. The enemy has been defeated. And he has that good news. And he won't take no for an answer. Come what may, he says, I must run with that good news, and he, has to, he wants to be a, a courier, a messenger of the good news. And that, uh, that is the model for my ministry. I want to be a courier, a messenger of the good news, come what may. And of course, as a runner, I kind of liked it too. So uh, it's a pleasure to celebrate this anniversary with you this morning, but uh, first we worship. And uh, so to do that, let's rise and face the cross.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. I, therefore, as a called and ordained servant of the word of God, and by his authority, forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, mercy. have mercy. For this holy house, for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Amen. with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, preserve your church with your perpetual mercy. Without you, our mortal flesh can only fail. So keep us and lead us away from all things hurtful 
and lead us to all things beneficial for our salvation. This we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Ghost, one God, now and always. Amen. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Our Old Testament today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, verses 18 to 23. For I know their works and their thoughts, and the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues. And they shall come and shall see my glory, and I will set a sign among them. And from them I will send survivors to the nations, to Tarshish, Hul, and Lud, who draw the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to the coastlands afar off that have not heard my fame or seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the nations, and they shall bring all your brothers from all the nations as an offering to the Lord, on horses and in chariots and in litters and on mules and dromedaries, to my holy mountain Jerusalem, says the Lord, just as the Israelites bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord, and some of them also I will take for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain. From new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The psalm reading is from 15, 50, 1 through 6. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Our God comes. He does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire. Around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our epistle reading for today comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 18 to 24, and 28 to 29. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire, and darkness, and gloom, and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a, word, a better word than the blood of Abel. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This is the word of the Lord. 
Now hear the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. So Jesus went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? Well, he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence. You taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place... There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out and people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God that engages us in meditation this morning. Don't you love it when, uh, when it's, uh, the, Bible ver the Bible verse referred to has a little A or a B or sometimes even a C after it like it is in the bulletin. Uh, the sermon is titled Nuclear Energy and then it says Isaiah 66, 19a. I don't know, have you ever seen that before? That just means the first part of the verse. Specifically this. And I will set a sign among them. I will set a sign among them. Now before I explain, and I'm going to explain right up front what is the meaning of that verse, and then we're going to dive in. But before I do that, I want to explain the context of uh, Isaiah as he's preaching this. Um, Isaiah, of course, a prophet you know, who lived six, seven hundred years before the birth of Jesus Christ. And he's primarily uh, prophesying... Uh, to a group of people who are in exile. They would be exiled a hundred or so years after he was uh, ministering. And so his, his book of prophecy is directed to a group of people who have been uh, removed and separated from, uh, from Jerusalem, from the priesthood, from, their, you know, from, from, the, from Mount Zion, from, from the practice of their faith. A lot of this we talked about in, when we dealt with the book of Daniel in Bible class. But, so that's who uh, Isaiah is uh, prophesying to. And then throughout that book, in fact, Isaiah is often remembered as the most uh, obvious set of biblical, Old Testament biblical prophecies uh, 
pointing to the Messiah, Jesus Christ himself. It's in Isaiah where you get the powerful prophecies of the virgin birth and of the death and resurrection and even the ascension of Jesus Christ. Isaiah is often even referred to by theologians as the fifth gospel. You know, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are very, very, very obviously about Jesus Christ. And then they'll refer to Isaiah as the fifth gospel because it is so obviously pointing forward to Jesus Christ. Here at the very end, this is the last prophecy in the book of Isaiah, chapter 66. There's just like one sentence that comes after this, which I will refer to in a little while. And um, this last prophecy is, yes, it's a prophecy about Jesus Christ, the Messiah. In addition to that, it is a prophecy about the Christian church. And it says, and this is where I'll explain to you, what, is it, what, what does he mean by I will set a sign in their midst? Um, he's talking about Jesus as the nucleus of who we are and what we're doing as a Christian church even now in the 21st century. And so, you know, kind of working off the idea of nuclear energy. When I told Meredith that I want, uh, you know, nuclear energy as a theme and I want the big nuclear, she like looked at me with a little bit of a question mark, like has pastor lost his marbles? Which I didn't bother to answer because it's probably true. Um, be that as it may, she, she did a lovely job again on this. Uh, but the idea here is Jesus Christ has been set in the center of who we are and why we're here and what we're about. You know, so what Isaiah has laid out here some 2,700 years ago, he's laid out for us the who, what, when, where, why, and how of the Christian church as it is centered around its nucleus, Jesus Christ. And then we, almost like, a, like electrons, you know, circle around the nucleus. That's who we are. So we're part of this picture. So that's how I'm going to uncover. I'm going to show you how Isaiah is describing uh, nuclear energy, <laughs> energy centered around Jesus Christ. And what he unpacks in this brief prophecy here, and then tags it with a promise, is that here's how nuclear energy works. You're scrutinized, you're finalized, you're uh, energized, <laughs> you're polarized, and then you're galvanized. Yeah, I worked hard on that one. Uh, okay, so we'll take that one at a time. First, uh, this is how nuclear energy... This sounds like it's going to be a science lecture, and I don't know, maybe there will be a little science at the end. Uh, but first, uh, you are scrutinized, and it comes here in the very, very beginning of verse 18. I know their works and their thoughts, says the Lord. I know their works and their thoughts. And here's where I'm going to just do a little bit of, of uh, uncovering. I'm just going to pull back the curtain a little bit on the, on the English and show you the Hebrew that's underneath for those two words, works and thoughts. Yeah, uh, maybe that comes across us in sounding slightly benign. I know their words and their works and their thoughts. I'm going to say it this way, and this is a, a, a faithful uh, rendition of what is meant here in the Hebrew. I know their schemes and their devices, says the Lord. I know their schemes and their devices. Now, look, he's ma Isaiah's making it perfectly clear. He's already indicated in the verse just before this that he is talking about everyone. He says, those who sanctify and purify themselves to go into the gardens, okay, he's talking about those, and those who are eating pig's flesh and the abomination. See, see everybody, both the, the, the Christians and the non-Christians. Both the Israelites and the rest of the world. Okay? Everybody uh, shall come to an end together, declares the Lord. That's the end of verse 17. So when he says, for I know their schemes and their devices, uh, he's talking about you as much as he's talking about everyone else. Now what does he mean by schemes and devices? 
Well, you can probably figure it out without too much exposition from me. But let me just put it to you this way. We all have schemes and devices. Schemes being more like the, uh, the, the workings of a mind. Devices being more of a behavioral thing. See, works and thoughts. Um, so as a, you've got to do your own work on this. You've got to hear this as a... Uh, as, as God saying to you, specifically, you've got to hear this as God saying to you, listen, I know your schemes. I know your devices. I know the ways your mind works to try and justify yourselves before one another and before me. I know, how, I know what you're up to. I know how you put up a front to make other people think better about you than the, even how you think about yourself. I know, says the Lord. I know how sometimes you, you want to just, you, you can't tolerate it if someone around you is wrong. You just constantly have to be correcting people. Constantly, constantly, because you've got to have the right word. And it's, it's a beautiful thing to speak the truth. But you're out there truthing without much love. That's a scheme. It's a way of justifying yourself so that you feel better about yourself without actually being better. Because the truth applied without love is violent. Meanwhile, half of the rest of you are afraid to confront anybody about anything because you're so busy being loving that you refuse to speak the truth. And so you'll see things that are wrong or you'll know things, maybe that your spouse is doing that are wrong, but you, you're afraid to bring it up because you despise the conflict. And you, so you just avoid it and you pretend and you hope it'll pass. And you're being loving without any truth. You can't do truth without love. You can't do love without truth. Love and truth have to come together. It's hard work. And to some extent, we probably all fit into one of those two schemes or another. Now, that's just scratching the surface. There are as many schemes of self-justification as there are people in this room. You've got to, you've got to see yourself as God sees you. He sees you as a person who's desperately trying to find a way to, f to feel like you belong, to feel like you're worthy, to feel like you matter. And you're busy doing it in a way that you're, is self-generative. You want to make up your own way of being justified. And God says, I, I know all those schemes. I know about your lies, your little white lies and your big whoppers. I know about all the things that you... Now, that's the schemes. What about devices? And devices are maybe even easier uh, to, to, to diagnose, <laughs> if we can use that word. Our devices are those things that uh, are those behaviors of ours that we rely on to create a sense of stability in our lives. But it's really not stability at all. It's a, a reliance on a, a, on a falsehood. So, for instance, if you're... Um, there are some of you possibly, I, I don't really know, because I, I've actually never talked about this with any of you before, but there are some of you who are probably, uh, who probably can't get by the day without a cigarette or two, or maybe a pack or two. And that's a device. That is a device, that's you convincing yourself. Now, of all we know, I mean, come on, this is the 21st century, we know what kind of harm we do to our bodies when we breathe smoke into our lungs on purpose. I mean, there's a reason why when your house is on fire, you get on the ground. It's so you don't have to breathe that stuff in. And me, here you are lighting it up and, and volunteering it into your body. We already know all about that. And do we have freedom to smoke the cigarettes? Yeah, we do. Um, but if you can't quit, if you can't quit, it's a device. It's something you're hanging on to because you, you just gotta, you've got to feel something about yourself that without it you feel is going to be lost. Now, that's a benign example. There are far more destructive kinds of behaviors that we do. Please, do some self-examination. 
And hear the Lord God saying, listen, I know you. I know your schemes and I know your devices. You've been scrutinized. Are you okay with that? You, you need to be because you've come to the, his house. And if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Now, that's what it means to be scrutinized. It means that God knows who you are and he knows your sin. He knows the evil you work. He knows it all. There's no, you might be hiding from each other. You're not hiding from him. You've been scrutinized. Now, you've also been finalized. Look, he says the time is coming. This entire section, if you look it up in your Bible, it's called the judgment of the Lord, the judgment day of the Lord, the great judgment. I don't know however your Bible titles it. This one says final judgment. <laughs> right? The time is coming. That's because I probably can say every time this language is used, in, especially in prophetic uh, literature, the time is coming, it's referring to God's judgment. And I don't know if you've been paying attention to all of the readings that were read this morning, but the theme of God's judgment is throughout every single one of them. Even the psalm had it in it, right? You, hopefully you caught that. If not, you've got your bulletin. Bring it home. Do, your, do some work on that and, and examine that. The, the theme of God's judgment is inescapable in the Bible. Now, this is one of those topics that makes people uncomfortable in 21st century United States of America. The, the God who judges. And I just want to say for a moment that uh, this is going to be the, the primary subject of Bible class this morning. In our walk through Genesis, we're, we've come now to the, the great flood. And uh, it's inescapable that the flood of Noah, the flood, the great flood of Genesis, you know, 679, that is the judgment of God Upon the, e oh, on the evil of the earth, the violence that he sees on the earth. And it, I, it's an unpopular notion today. In fact, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reason. The, the, the story of the, the great flood is one reason why many people don't want to believe in the God of the Bible. I want, I've, I'm all for the God of love, they'll say. The God who accepts, the God who loves, the God who... But a God who would who would wipe out all life on the face of the earth, life that he himself created? What kind of God is that? I don't want to have anything to do with it. And I'm going to tell you something. The, for, for you and for me, for, for Bible-believing Christians like us, we need to be able to hear that and understand it and reply because the, the God who judges is the only hope there is for this world. A God who judges. I'm going to unpack that a great deal more in Bible class, and I'm going to hopefully prepare you to, to be able to talk about this story of the flood, the destruction of all flesh. Uh, and then by, you know, by virtue of understanding that, you can, you can unpack the entire theme in Scripture of the God who judges. Right? Please, you know, come check that out and learn that. If you can't, then, uh, you, you know, find the link in the email on Mondays. Um, but here it is again in this text, that the time is coming. In other words, you've been finalized. You've been known. You've been scrutinized. And what God has found about you is evil, is sin, and it is terminal. Your time as sinful human flesh has an end. And um, it's, a, it's a hard bit of news, but it's, it's necessarily true. Um, again, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If you, deceiving ourselves, that's schemes and devices. But once we recognize that and once we come to a, 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 a fuller understanding of what God sees when he sees us, we must realize that we are flesh and that none of those schemes, none of those devices, there's nothing in our power 
that can put an end to the evil that we even ourselves are responsible for. All those schemes and devices that we rely on, those, you know, for, it's like a, a false source of energy. They'll, they'll deplete us. Some of you may even this morning feel depleted as it is and maybe the reason you're so worn out is because you won't stop relying on those schemes and devices. And what you're feeling, what you're sensing about yourself and feeling so exhausted, you're feeling that foreboding sense of being finalized. It won't work. You can't keep it up. The end has been announced The judgment has been established. It is coming, and indeed it has come. Now, you've also been energized. And the the prophet Isaiah says, listen, um, they shall come and they shall see my glory, and I will set a sign among them, and from them I will send survivors. There's life after judgment, folks. There's life after judgment because the judgment that God sends, this sign that He has sent among us, is Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. The sign that He has sent, and again, this is an, an Old Testament prophecy pointing to Jesus Christ himself. So there is a fulfillment of this prophecy in the life and and ministry, the death for the forgiveness of evil, for the forgiveness of sins, for the... It's Jesus taking responsibility for our schemes and our devices. It's him bearing those things on his own flesh and the the decay and the exhaustion and the, the termination that comes from relying on them. He bore that on Himself. That's the sign that God has placed among us. Jesus Christ has in fact, and as a point in history, He has suffered and died to forgive you all those things. All those things that you found in your self-examination and more. All those things that God knows about you. They've all been met by Jesus on the cross and they've been forgiven and because he's risen from the dead, you've been energized. Look, I will send survivors. You are a survivor! It's, that's a a completed act. The, the, The judgment has happened now in history. It's not, it's not coming. The, the, the return of Jesus, the final judgment day, you know, the, the, the second coming of Jesus Christ, when He will judge all flesh on earth, you will stand in that judgment because your judgment has already taken place in history. You are living post-judgment. You've had a, you've, you, your life has now been set with a seal, one of our readings said. So, this is certainly energizing good news, but where does the energy come from? Ah, it comes from the nucleus. Look what they will see. She, he will, the, the sign among us that, 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 we're, that energizes us, it says, they shall see my glory. My glory. Now, I want, I want to share with you a little bit about what that word means, too. Again, we're going to just kind of peel back the curtain a little bit on the, on the, on the Hebrew language. The word uh, for glory in, in the Hebrew language has to do with weightiness or significance. It has to do with substance. The word means, like, huge, <laughs> in a way. It means heavy. It means large. It means substantive. And it's, in a sense, it's the opposite of what the uh, prophet in Ecclesiastes means when he says, and we, we covered this actually just a few weeks ago. You remember? Vanity, oh, vanity, everything is vanity. What is there for a man to gain by all his toil on earth? This too is vanity. And we talked about how, uh, how 
meaningless. How, like vapor is the way that word comes across in Hebrew. It's, it's a wisp. It's nothing. It's, it's emptiness. And the very opposite then. So that characterizes exactly what we've been talking about. The emptiness of these false pursuits. The very opposite is the glory of God. The substance of God. The fact that Jesus Christ is undeniably real. He was born in human flesh. People touched his hands. They ate with him. He ate. He's not a ghost. He ate food. They grabbed onto his feet after his resurrection. They wanted to know he was real. See, back in those days, they believed that ghosts didn't have feet. So you know that story where the ladies are grabbing onto his feet after he's been raised from the dead? They needed to know that this Jesus has substance. He's real. That's his glory. His glory is that the victory over that which would end you is complete. Now, if that doesn't energize you, what does? Really, this is the greatest good news. This is why the message, by the way, of judgment is so necessary in the world today. We'll get more to that in a little while. But uh, you've, you've, yes, you've been scrutinized. Yes, you've been finalized. But you have been energized by Jesus Christ himself who has been set in your midst. His is the glory of God. You might imagine the glory of God as being an explanation of his very name. Remember, he says, my name is I Am. He just is. He is substance itself. Nothing exists that doesn't exist in him. He is our nucleus. He is the, the energy that, uh, that, that moves us. And, and look, I will, you know, I will set aside, I will, I will send them. So he has energized us as survivors to the nations. It, it, he lists them. And by the way, Dina, you must have practiced. You, your pronunciation of these, these words in here was perfect, right? So to Tarshish and to Pool and to Lud and to Tubal and Javan. You know what's going on there? The, the prophet Isaiah is saying to a bunch of uh, sectarian thinkers, to a bunch of Israelites whose whole concept was that God only belongs to the Israelites. And Isaiah is saying, eh -eh. I belong to the world. I belong to everyone. And I'm sending, I'm energizing you to be messengers, to be couriers of the good news, to go out into Luke. And I don't know where those places are today, but I do know the, some of the names of the towns in Hall County. And that's where you're being sent. Your energy is to be spent getting out there and being an, a, a witness to the glory of God. Uh, I will you, it says, they shall declare my glory among the nations. Every one of you. He says, some of them I'll even, uh, I'll even uh, uh, raise up as, as priests and Levites. You actually are servants in the house of the Lord. It's fantastic. Um, and more than that, look at this. It says, they shall bring these brothers of yours from all the nations as an offering to the Lord. Just as the Israelites bring their grain offering in a clean vessel. Here's what he's saying. Just kind of cut through the, the, the uh, rhetoric here. The Israelites would bring their offerings in a clean vessel, a, pu a ritually purified vessel, a vessel that was, was sanctified and set apart for a special service. That special service was the worship of the Lord their God. And they would bring their offering in this, only in this clean vessel because what they're bringing to the Lord is, is it, you know, the fruit of their, minister, of, their, of their work, their ministry. And so you now are that vessel. You're the thing that has been purified. You're the thing that has been cleaned and purified, sanctified, and set apart for the holy work of ministry in this world. And the thing that you're, you're this vessel, the thing that you're bringing into the, to the worship of the Lord are you the, those brothers and sisters of yours out there in Hall County who uh, you've witnessed to the glory of the Lord. And they are the harvest, you know? They're, the, they're the, the fruit of your labor. 
Every single one of you is an evangelist of the good news about Jesus Christ. Every single one of you. Why it's so important for you to be able to have an answer about the God who judges. So that you can bear witness to the glory of God. So that you can be that purified vessel bringing back the offerings. Those people who haven't heard, who don't know, who sit for the first time in a Christian worship service and hear about Jesus. Wouldn't it be great if someone were in this room this morning and, has heard and is hearing about Jesus for the very first time? You can make that happen. Would you? That's what you're energized for. Now, yes, you've been scrutinized and finalized and energized, but you've also been polarized. And I want to explain this. This is where a little science lesson comes in. How many of you are fishermen? A bu- I guess a bunch of you. You have polarized glasses for fishing, right? What the- polarized glasses are amazing because you put them on and all of a sudden, all of the glare from the water disappears and you can see the fish underneath the water, right or wrong. Come on, this deserves an amen. I mean, come on, fishermen. Well, I'm going I'm to explain to you, being a former optics guy for Nikon microscopes, uh, I'm going to explain to you how polarized light works this morning. Light, as you know, behaves as a wave. That's one of the ways light behaves. And waves have a polarity. They, have, they operate on two axes, this axis and this axis. So a wave of light kind of goes like this, right? And, uh, and that's its polarity. Now, other waves of light might be operating under this polarity or this polarity. See, there's all kinds of scattered light waves, particularly when they're reflected off of a surface. A polarizer is a picket fence for light. It blocks all of the other polarities of light and only only permits through light that is organized under a certain polarity. Now, you can test your polarized glasses by grabbing a a, a second set of them. And if you take your polarized glasses, one in front of the other, and rotate one of them 90 degrees, have you ever done that? Now it blocks all the light because your picket fences are now kind of like, uh, they're combining to to block every light. By the way, if you buy a pair of polarized sunglasses and they don't do that, you got ripped off. Because they're not polarizers. You've been polarized as Christians. You haven't been energized merely to run around haphazardly in a in a disorganized fashion. It says here that you are, you know, you're out there declaring your glory among the nations, but you're returning with this, this offering of human, you know, people, the, these people that, you, that you've witnessed to, to the glory of God, and you're returning them to my holy mountain, Jerusalem. An Old Testament reference to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Your polarity, your polarity is from Jesus Christ to the world and back to Jesus Christ and back to the world and back to Jesus Christ and back to the world. You can think of it like this. Sunday morning, here you are, gathered around the nucleus to hear and to to be forgiven of your sins and to be strengthened in your faith to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and then to be sent back out and not in a haphazard way but in a highly organized way, in a polarized way, in a perfectly organized way. This is why it's important to have church councils and elders and uh, planning and meetings. And it's important to have all that stuff. And, uh, you know, look, we we as a church, I have to say, the the polarity around here is profoundly good. We're, we're, We're polarized well here. I want to just pause for a moment to give thanks to God for the work, Dina comes from you, uh, largely Janet comes, Janet Fitzgerald comes through your hard work and the hard work of all of you who are small group ministry leaders. Folks, a full 90 of you, that's nine with a zero after it, a full 90 of you have signed up to be in a small group. That is incredibly amazing. That means... <laughs> 
that the, that the, the work of bearing witness to Jesus Christ as a Savior is, is very active. It means you guys are energized. And my prayer for all those small groups, my prayer is that you remain polarized towards Jesus Christ and the world. That that polarity is maintained. So if you're signed up for a small group, please um, make sure you go. Participate. Keep that, that polarity uh, at work in your life. So uh, again, thanks be to God for that incredible work. Now lastly, let's kind of tag this on in the end. Uh, you've been galvanized. All of this uh, in Isaiah, all of this prophecy, this, he says this is what the church is going to look like. And lo and behold, that is what the church looks like. Somehow Isaiah understood it. 2,700 years ago. Um, but he, he, he galvanizes all of this with a promise. Now, it doesn't set apart in the text as we've published it in the, in the bulletin, but it's set apart here in verse 22. In fact, if you look at verse 22, it starts with little quotation marks. That's because this is the voice of the Lord making a promise. As the new heavens and the new earth that I, shall, that I make shall remain before me. In other words, as eternal as God's work is, as, as cosmically forever as God can be, so shall you and your offspring and your name also remain. This promise means that you are forever and ever and ever alive to God in Jesus Christ. Forever and ever and ever. If you've doubted it, hear it again. Your doubts won't invalidate it. Your doubts is just another scheme and device that God knows and forgives. You can't invalidate God's grace by doubting it. <laughs> you can only need it more. And so here it is. There is nothing you can ever do that will make God stop loving you and forgiving you and receiving you centered around the glory of his son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
stand as we go to our Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks for your goodness. We bless you for the love that sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, our Comforter, for your church, for the means of grace, for the lives of all faithful and just people, and for the hope that you've given us for the life to come. Help us to remain constant in the struggle of faith, empowered by the cross of Jesus Christ, filled with hope and filled with confidence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Grant health and favor to all who bear the offices of government in our land. Guard and protect also those who serve in the armed forces of our country. Give them faithfulness and success in their service and grant that their homecomings be joyful. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, by your word and spirit, comfort all those who are in sorrow, in need, in sickness, or any kind of adversity. Be with those also who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on all for whom death draws near. Sustain and bless all who care for those who suffer, Lord, in your mercy. And we remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you in your church on earth, who now rest from their labors. Keep us in fellowship with all your saints, bringing us at last to the joys of your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At this time, we say goodbye to our online audience. We thank you for joining us, and we invite you to send us any messages, uh, questions, comments, concerns that you might have for us. The Lord be with you.